Hi, how are you? Good. We have one for ourselves and one for my sister's kindergarten. Oh, that's great. They do you as an author study. Oh, isn't that so great? I'm so thrilled. Could you tell us the correct way to pronounce your name? Tommy? Yes. De Paola. De Paola. That's what I thought as an Italian American myself. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've been called lots of things. Yeah, I would imagine. De Paola. De Paola. Paola's always a good connotation. Yeah, right. Thank right. you so much. OK, my pleasure. Hi there. Good, all right. Does he have a report on you, or he's doing a report? Oh, really? Oh, it looks just like me. Except now I have a beard. That's wonderful. Congratulations. So in childhood, Tommy, you uh, said you wanted to sing and to dance and to draw. And where did that initial inspiration come from? Well, uh, actually, the full story is that my Italian relatives were visiting. Ah. And my older brother, who was four years older than I was, he was eight. They asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. And my brother said, I want to be Joe Palooka, Dick Tracy, and Buck Rogers. Now, I was only four, and I thought, oh, great, he wants to be a cartoon. <laughs> and my brother and I didn't get along. Uh, we never got along. Um, but I said, I know what I am going to be when I grow up. And they all yeah, said, yes, sure, sure. And I said, I'm going to be an artist, and I'm going to write stories and draw pictures for books, and I'm going to sing and tap dance on the stage. <laughs> and I can proudly sit here, it's going to be 77, and say that I have been paid for all of the above. <laughs> and I know where the singing and tap dancing came from, because my mother, uh, my father didn't much like the movies, and my mother loved the movies. And so, she could take me to the afternoon movie. That's when the movies used to start at noontime and you know, continuous showings. And of course, it was cheaper before 4 o'clock. And I grew up with two movie idols. That, and I really wanted to be both of them. Uh, and one of them was Shirley Temple. <laughs> and the other one was Mae West. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to admit, uh, my father had a movie camera, so 1933, 30, uh, 34, 35, um, we have home movies of me as Mae West smoking a candy cigarette <laughs> and as Shirley Temple tap dancing on the front stoop. Um, but um, I knew I wanted to be an artist because I had twin cousins who were artists. And my mother read aloud to me every single night. And we, had, we didn't have picture books in those days like we do now. Uh, but we had a collection. It was called the um, uh, Children's Hour. And it was a collection of, you know, uh, compilations of, of uh, um, uh, what do I want to say, uh, kind of, oh, you know, little snippets of stories, you know. Uh, um, condensation. Yeah, condensation, that's a good word. Uh, or, or a little, you know, like a chapter or so. And my mother would read me the stories. And what, of course, what I loved the most were the folk tales and Arabian Nights, and they had beautiful illustrations that were sort of tipped in, full color illustrations. And, uh, um, and I, I have those books in my library, and on some of them you can see where I've like added a little rouge to some of the faces. <laughs> and, <sighs> she's not pretty enough, you know. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the interesting thing is, my parents listened to me. And it was like, okay, he says he's gonna be an artist when he grows up, he's gonna be an artist. And of course, I went to t dancing school. And last summer, this was one of the greatest achievements of my life, Nick. Last summer, my old dancing partner, Carol Morrissey Griner, who's 76, or 70, yeah, she's 76. I'll be 77. I took Carol and my assistant, Bob, who's sitting over there, and Miss Leah, my tap dancing teacher, who's in her 90s, and her cousin, Miss Rhoda, who helped her out at the dancing school, her son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter, I took us all to see Billy Elliot. Oh. And uh, it was a magic, magic moment. And Miss Leah said, oh, I hope I wasn't like her, because you know the da dancing teacher in Billy Elliot's a little over the top. But halfway through the show, Leah leaned over and she said, you know, you could have done that. And I thought, well, gee. <laughs> 
too late. <laughs> but that's where that came from. And I never changed my mind about being an artist. In fact, I, I, my whole school career was devoted to getting into Pratt Institute, which my cousins were um, graduated from in 1940. Um, and you know, the rest is history. So if you've got nothing to do and a lot of time to do it, will you come and sign a book for me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Could you uh, talk a little bit about the role of theater in your book? Oh, yeah, well, of course, um, um, you know, I, uh, because I took dance, tap dancing lessons, every, every spring there'd be a recital, and Miss Leah recognized my overwhelming talent and always gave me a special little spot besides my um, normal you know, tap dance routines with my partners and, and the classes. One year I was a pirate. And um, another, uh, the first year I was uh, Old MacDonald I was, uh, and his wife, you know. Is, um, but um, so, you know, once that spotlight hit me that first time, it was like, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and so because, because of my, uh, my strong love of theater, um, in fact, Barbara Elliman, who's here, who's my biographer, uh, has met, written a really, really beautifully about how I use the theater setting, like proscenium, a proscenium, uh, a viewpoint. And I think that tr illustration, R uh, Richard Lindner was the first, uh, the, you know, the artist, yeah. the, the pop artist, um, uh, who taught at Pratt, taught illustration. And he made, he said to us, join the play shop, which was the theater group. I, he didn't have to tell me because I was already a member. Um, he said, because doing an illustration or doing a book is like putting on a play. You have to cast the play, so you have to like interview, you, know, you have auditions, you know, and that would be sketching characters to see what they look like. Then you have to dress them, so you're the costume designer. Then you have to put them in a place, so you're the scenery designer. And then you have to uh, do the lighting with the paint and your, and your color. So it's, and then you have to have a story that uh, keeps the, especially a young audience, um, amused and attention, uh, pay attention to the whole time. You know, looking at a painting is so different. You know, you look at one painting and you can kind of grasp a painting very quickly. But with a book, you have that time space, you know, continuum. So I, I see a strong, you know, strong relationship. I still do. Mm -hmm. Just follow me around. You'll see theater every month. Right. <laughs> so I would like to to turn up for a moment to let the earth, mm. uh, let the whole earth sing praise, because uh, when you look at this book, uh, and the, the text is taken from uh, the 148th Psalm and a chapter from the book of Daniel, um, uh, the canticles of the three, three, young, men. three young men. And, and the art, uh, on the one hand, it looks at uh, Mexican folk art, but also the work of the great French artist Henri Matisse, of course, whom uh, Tommy has illustrated, uh, the Monsieur Satie. Um, but I think what struck me in going back and rereading both of the texts and this extraordinarily beautiful language is how, how do you figure out the, the, I mean, the words that are here are so carefully chosen, so carefully selected. How do you do that? Well, <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I, I just did it. Uh, what, what this is, there are two, two quite long pieces, biblical pieces, but they're very reminiscent of each other because um, I've, um, I've been always very interested in the Benedictine uh, monks' uh, order. Uh, and in the morning, they do uh, their morning prayer. They open the day by singing the canticle of, of the three young men, and that's let, let the whole, you know, let the whole earth sing praise, and it goes through, you know, um, uh, well, you know, the, you. yeah, the best thing to do would be to kind sing of it. <laughs> sing it. Sing yeah. <laughs> um, I did, I did um, allow myself to be inspired by, I, you probably can't see it, it's kind of pale, by the Otami people's uh, embroideries. They live in um, northern Mexico, but I, we started it out, my editor was, very helpful in this, my editor Nancy Paulson, um, because we wanted to we wanted it to be a book that would be uh, maybe have a little selling point for Earth Day, 
And uh, so we started it out with the elements, you know, sun and moon, and I, I, and I condensed it all. So there's not a lot of um, uh, re repetition, but sun and moon, stars and comets in the heavens, praise God. Light and darkness, day and night, showers and frost, ice and snow, bless God. Fire, heat, lightning, and clouds. Mountains, hills, seas, rivers, and fountains, praise God. Fruitful trees, cedars, and all that sprout upon the earth, Whales, fish, and all creatures that move in the waters, bless God. Birds, everything that flies in the air. Dogs, cats, all animals and creeping things on earth, praise God. All people, young and old, let everything in heaven and on earth, bless and praise God. It sort of just fell into place. Well, yeah, yeah but. <laughs> Thank you. And the nice, the nice thing, the nice thing about this book is that both of those, both of those um, original poems, prayers, psalms are in the Old Testament, so it's um, it's a little more ecumenical. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I guess that, in a way. Uh, you recount uh, in Barbara's uh, biography, or through Barbara, a conversation that you had with the great uh, artist, graphic designer, children's book illustrator, Leo Leone, who right. expressed concern, do you ever worry about not having an idea? <laughs> Could you? Yeah, it was at the Bologna Book Festival in Italy, Bologna, Italy, and Leo um, invited, uh, well, I, I knew his editor, um, at, um, I think he was at Ferrar Strauss, um, what, was it, what was his name, uh, Fabio, Fabio Cohen. Cohen. Yeah, Fabio Cohen. They, were, they were, uh, had known each other before the war in Italy, and they both had left because of the anti-Semitism and the fascism. And, but Leo was, lived in Italy, he, uh, and we, were at a re we went out to dinner and uh, to a little restaurant up in the hills uh, outside of Bologna, and it, the restaurant, Leo told me, was translated into the eating dump. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the greasy spoon of Bologna. <laughs> and, at di you know, I was put next to Leo, and he leaned over and said, I want to ask you, do you ever worry that you're going to run out of ideas? I said, all the time. So I said, I have a drawer in my studio that's filled, you know, with 90% of them are bad ideas, and will never become a book, but anytime I got an idea, I'd shove it in that drawer. And then I always made sure, before I finished one a project, I had the next one all lined up because that fear of suddenly facing an empty page, an empty piece of paper, or an empty notebook um, is genuine. And I went through that a couple of years ago. I, I, got, I came to a grinding halt. Part of it was health problems, but the other uh, part was I kind of ran out of ideas. And um, so I ran to my drawer, and there they were. There were some good ideas in that drawer. And one of them was this book that I, that I had always wanted to do um, from, you know, from way back. Uh, but I wanted to do a more um, maybe ponderous work, not quite as lighthearted. And uh, this is like a little amuse-bouche, right. you know. Uh, so, um, but Biblical bonbon. Yeah, right, right, right. But, you know, a friend of mine asked me, Carolyn Kroll, who's a, a fellow illustrator, she was working on a text, and she was having a, the problem that most writers um, do have a problem with. And I had it the f uh, first few books I s um, attempted to write. Um, I was already illustrating books, but, and I, but I got uh, asked to, to write a text. And um, uh, there's some amusing uh, parts to the story. The editor took me to lunch, which was unheard of. You, they, all these editors in New York, they never took an illustrator to lunch. It was always, you know, come before lunch or come after lunch because I have to entertain a new author. You know, and so, um, but Mary took me to lunch to the plaza. And she, um, this is when the plaza was really something, you know. The plaza. The plaza. 
And she immediately, uh, she knew the head waiter, and he said, your usual, Miss Russell? She said, yeah. I said, what will you have, Tommy? And I said, um, I will, I'll have what you're having. And she was having a, a very dry vodka martini up. <laughs> and um, that, those were the days of the two martini lunch that was quite prevalent in the business world. But Mary's idea on a Friday afternoon was a four martini lunch. <laughs> So I don't know how I got back to my loft on Canal Street, <laughs> but I woke up the next morning with a tremendous hangover. But on my desk was the beginning of my first manuscript. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Writer's block, vodka. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> but the thing looked like the first draft for Gone with the Wind. It's about that thick. And Mary was very kind. She said, you know, Tommy, if, you're, if this is going to be a 32-page picture book with a picture on every page, you're going to have to tighten it up a little bit. <laughs> well, I found out one secret was that because I was the artist, I didn't have to do long descriptions. In my case, one picture was worth a thousand words, you know, because I, I just had to draw it. Think of a manuscript as making a stock. You throw the bones in. You throw the, uh, you know, the, the necks, the backs of the chicken in the pot. You put in carrots. You put in um, cloves stuck in an onion. You put in um, uh, celery. And then you light the fire, and you bring it slowly to a boil, and all this scum rises to the top. And what you do is you, you strain all that off with a spoon. You get rid of all of that stuff, and then it, the stock starts to bubble, and then you lower it, and you let it simmer, and you let it simmer, and you let it simmer. And the longer you let it simmer, the more flavor you're going to get out of all of that stuff that's in the pot. Then you strain it through a sieve with cheesecloth so you get pure, pure, pure stock. And you throw all that other stuff, which has no flavor left in it, away. You put it in the compost or down the disposal or, you know, Give it to your sister or you know, for <laughs> dinner or whatever. Then, if you really want a crystal clear stock, you might not know this, but you, you take an egg white and beat up an egg white and pour it in the simmering stock. And that egg white will coagulate and take all of the impurities out of that stock. And then you strain it again, and there you have you know, this beautiful, beautiful stock that you can see through with so much flavor. And it's all of those ideas and all of those hours are distilled into one little spoonful. And that's the same way with a manuscript. You have to let it bubble. You have to let all the impurities rise to the surface. Then you have to very patiently, you know, uh, uh, cook it down. And, um, and you have to be patient. But it's a, it takes time. So as a book is cooking down, do you put it aside for a while to let it simmer, or...? Yeah, I think so. I do, yeah. And, uh, you know, in the editing process, I love the editing process because I don't even start to think about the pictures. I might think about them a little bit and get some ideas, but during the editing process, I let that be the main focus. And a really, um, I've had some really great editors in my life. Editors who, you know, I, I love that some authors say, oh, I never let them touch my manuscript. Well, maybe they should have. <laughs> you know, so I do put it aside. And sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the first draft is like nowhere, so I have to really put that aside and not think about it. But when I start my artwork, I just keep going on the artwork. I, I, you know, I get so excited about doing the artwork that um, I'll be starting a new book. Uh, I'm just waiting to get the edited manuscript from um, the, the copy edited manuscript because it's going to be hand lettered. Uh, as this one is, but with different lettering, and it's called The Birds of Bethlehem, and it's a Christmas book. So I have to get it done this summer, so it'll be publishable next year. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, my last question. Mm -hmm. If you were banished to a desert island, what three books would you take with you? Uh, well, I, I sort of knew this was coming, so um, we used to play this game in, in uh, San Francisco in the set, uh, 60s, the summer of love, summers <laughs> of love. Um, and I, I was introduced to the I Ching. And I would definitely take the I Ching. It's a book of, of um, divining 
uh, that you throw um, coins or sticks, and then you read these um, little chapters. And they're rich. They're, they're like a Rorschach test. You know, they put all kinds of ideas in your head. So I take that for inspiration. I'd probably... Only three, huh? <laughs> well, okay. I take Hitty, Her First Hundred Years, which is a children's book. Mm -hmm. I can't take, uh, uh, can I take, uh, well, uh, you can have two volumes. I can have what, two volumes? I mean, you can get two parts. Well, the one I'm, the, the two I'm thinking of are, you know, the two I'm thinking of are three-part books. Okay. One is Kristen Laverne's Daughter. I, I, I leave Hitty home. I take Kristen Laverne's Daughter by Sigurd Unset, and I take um, His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. The three books in the, the, his dark materials that was originally uh, published under by Philip Pullman. It's um, uh, the uh, golden compass, the subtle knife, and the amber spyglass. I think he's one of the greatest writers on our planet today. And he likes my work, too. <laughs> so I invite all of you to think about which three of Tommy's books you would take to a desert island. And if you don't have them, you can get them in the bookstore. And <laughs> uh, so now I'd like to throw it uh, open to the audience uh, to any questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your question and I'm going to repeat it so that everybody hears it, particularly the, uh, the camera. So I see a hand. Is that scratching or is that a question? Yeah. What was his first book? What was his first book? <coughs> the first book that I illustrated was a, a picture science book called Sound, and it was all about sound. And um, the New York Times reviewed it, and they said this, the illustrations are far too imaginative <laughs> for this to be a working science book. And I was thrilled. <laughs> I was thrilled. Um, and it's out of print. The first book I wrote and illustrated was called The Wonderful Dragon of Timlin, and that's also out of print. And it probably is good that they're out of print. <laughs> Uh, this little boy in the back, and then I'll... What was the favorite book that you worked on? Oh, Streganona. <laughs> that was, the first Streganona was so much fun to do. And now I think there are 11 of them. I think there are 11 Streganonas. I, I really just enjoy doing those books. They, they just, I don't even write them. She whispers them in my <laughs> ear. I think that you learn when you, your, your whole life depends upon the creative process or your imagination, uh, making things. I love this once. I read that ar the artist is a person who makes things out of nothing, except maybe an idea, a feeling. So I would say that I just keep my, my whole body and, and heart and soul and mind open to whatever comes along. And it can be something so mundane, you know, um, um, so there's not any just one. Some people get very inspired by, you know, various things. I just try to stay open. That's why I think if you look at, um, there's two things I'm very proud of um, after having been in this career for 45 years. And one is that my work is recognizable. And uh, there, I, there I pay homage to my mentor of all time, Henri Matisse. I never met him, but uh, um, I devour his work whenever I can. Um, and um, he wanted his work to be recognizable. He also wanted his work, he wanted the viewer to feel like they were sitting in a comfortable armchair when they looked at his work. They, he didn't want the viewer to be put in turmoil the way Pablo Picasso's work uh, does for some viewers because it's more cerebral. It, it, it takes too much figuring out, like what is he doing? Whereas oh yes, there's a lady in a red dress sitting with yellow flowers by the table. I wouldn't draw it that way, but he did. And so I'm glad. So that's the way I feel about my work. So I'm very proud that people recognize it. And I'm also very proud that now, suddenly, some of the reviewers, like um, uh, the Horn book, um, um, what can I think of his name? Roger Sutton. Yeah, Roger Sutton. He, he reviewed um, a, um, my Christmas treasury, that a joy to the world that um, Penguin brought out last Christmas, and it's a compendium of uh, four different Christmas stories that I've done over the years. And he said, 
in that review, just it's amazing. Quite often, Capella's work can be dismissed as being the same old thing over and over again. But all you have to do is look at this, this uh, Joy to the World to see his very deep, different styles that all meld into one. So I'm very proud of those two things. Yes. Oh, uh, there's what, a, what's, the, what, oh, what's the method of figuring out your color palettes? One of my favorite classes in art school back in the early 50s was color. And, I've, uh, and, and there's only one way to really and truly learn color, and that's to use it. You know, just, we had to do these amazing things. We, we got this stuff called rich art tempera. And they, were, um, they corresponded to the Munsell color theory which um, was, was devised by um, m a man named Munsell in Germany to help with the dyeing of wool and fabric for the um, decorative arts. And rich art matches their paints to the, what's called the hues of the Munsell color theory. The Munsell color theory has three parts, hue, chroma, and um, a value. Value is the, uh, the darkness and lightness of a color. Chroma is how much blue is in that blue. The hue is the name of the color, like blue, red, green, blue, green, and he breaks it down. Anyway, we had to take huge 30 by 40 sheets of illustration board, divide them up into one inch squares, and then mix color using two hues and black and white. And we had, and I, I remember I was able to mix up about 3,000, 3,500 different squares. And that's the way you learn. That really is the way you learn by using it. So, and, and every book, the, uh, every book, you know, it expresses a color palette. And I think that one of the things I think is a terrible mistake artists are making today is, um, especially illustrators, they're using the computer too much. Um, the only way to really understand color is to buy a bunch of paint and get a whole bunch of paper and just mix and throw it away. I mean, you, you're just mixing and then put them, uh, you know, beside each other and see what happens to them. I was also lucky to study with Joseph Albers one summer uh, who taught um, color theory at Yale. And uh, that was a great class and that really taught me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know, what's your creative process? Like when somebody brings you a book and says, this is what I, I'm looking to do, how do you come up with the idea to do pictures and stuff like that? What is the creative process when somebody brings you a book? Well, um, nobody brings me books anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> or an idea. No, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I started out illustrating a lot of other people's books. and what, So the first thing I would do is, of course, read the manuscript, and if I didn't like it, I wouldn't do it, even if I was, you know, only had a little piece of lettuce in my refrigerator. <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, I think an illustri to illustrate other people's words, you have to be respectful of the author. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you see right away, oh gee, if they only did this, it'd be a better book. So if that happened, happens or happened, I'd discuss it with my editor. And then, because, you know, the art director is a new, breed to picture books. That we, the editors used to be the uh, art directors too in the early days. My own creative process is it's different with every book. Um, but, um, and I'm not trying to keep any secrets because I don't think I have any secrets, you know. I think the main secret is, you know, to stay awake. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I also said, um, I think it's important that you have courage. Yeah. Here. Wow. What was your inspiration to write Stegonella? Well, my editor at Bob's Merrill, which was a publisher, her name was Ellen Roberts, she said to me, okay, we want you to retell and illustrate a folk tale. Because, and, and then it was like, oh, they think I'm ready for the Caldecott. <laughs> <laughs> which isn't really true. 
But, um, but a lot of Caldecott winners, that's an award given by the American Library Association for the best illustrated book of any given year. Um, I got the bigger prize, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Stregadona did win an honor book, though. And so she, Ellen said to me, what was your favorite story, <coughs> sorry, what was your favorite story growing up, favorite folk tale? And I said right off the top of my head, oh, the porridge pot story. I really loved that story. And so she said, well, go see if you can find a copy of it that's in public domain and um, see if you can retell it. And the porridge pot story is about a, a, a sort of a sorcerer lady um, who has a, a big porridge pot and porridge is oatmeal. And she goes away for the day and her servant girl gets hungry so she makes the pot cook and then she can't stop it. And so it fills the whole village with oatmeal. And I thought, it's still a funny idea, but no kid in 1970, whatever year it was, is gonna know what porridge is. <laughs> and I'm not gonna call it the oatmeal pot, because that doesn't sound right, you know. Um, and in Mae West, this is where Mae West came in <laughs> in my life again. You know, she used to use alliteration a lot, and, and um, she'd put words with the same uh, um, sound together. And I thought, porridge pot, porridge pot, pot pasta pot. Aha! I'll change the lady. I, I'll take it out of Scotland. I'll put it in Italy. I'll make it pasta. I'll get rid of the servant girl, and I'll have Big Anthony, who's not dumb. He just doesn't pay attention. And that's how that book came to be. Now, the, the illustrations, I was teaching at a college in New London, New Hampshire, where I still live. And we used to have to, this was in the 70s, and we were not allowed to take um, attendance. Because, you know, it was, yeah, it was the 70s, you know. <laughs> the inmates were running the institution. <laughs> but we had to go to weekly faculty meetings, and they took attendance. <laughs> so I would sit in the back row, and I always had a yellow pad like, like Nick has there, and I would doodle. And everyone thought I was taking notes. <laughs> I was doodling. And I was doodling a, a little Punchinello face. You know, Punchinello was the character from Commedia dell'arte. And I was very interested in Commedia dell'arte because I was teaching in the theater department, not in the art department. And Punchinello, you know, has a big nose and a big chin. But all of a sudden, this little Punchinello I was, profile I was drawing suddenly had a little kerchief on it. And I looked and I said, oh, her name is Strega Nona. And the rest is history. She built me my swimming pool. <laughs> okay. The one thing they did, the first thing they did, as soon as the war was over, the Second World War was over, and rationing had stopped, that Christmas after the, in 1945, I had just turned 11, under the Christmas tree, for me, was nothing but art supplies. Paints, oil set, oil paint sets, watercolor sets, pastels, uh, pads and pads and pads of paper, all these books on how to draw horses and whatever, you know, all kinds of books. And then they did something even more special. We had a finished off attic that was our playroom in, um, in bad weather and in the winter. And um, you know, I grew up in Connecticut, in Meriden, Connecticut. And I was given half of the attic for my studio. So they gave me not only supplies, but they gave me a place to work. And that was, the, that was just fantastic. They didn't send me to art lessons, which is, I think, a good idea, because it wasn't until I got to Pratt, I didn't have any bad habits that I had to get rid of. And you can get a lot of bad habits when you're younger and you get sent to, you know, art school. And then, of course, I, you know, my, my favorite person in school was the art supervisor who came to the school, um, you know, maybe once every three months or something uh, and went to every class. But um, so, and I, you know, they, they, knew that, they knew that I was serious. We have time for one more question. Do you have any advice for illustrators just starting out? Yeah, uh, go work with a plumber. 
<laughs> no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I, I, you know, there seems to be an awfully big demand for good plumbers these days. Yeah. Uh, my, if my advice is, now a lot of people don't agree with this, but my advice is to study, to go to an art school, study illustration, and there are art schools that teach um, uh, children's book illustration specifically, and go to uh, bookstores and libraries and just devour as many books as you can. And um, you really have to know your technique uh, and how to draw. How to draw is absolutely important. People that look at my work, they don't see the, um, the knowledge that I have of drawing a realistic figure. But if you went to the University of Connecticut, where my archives are, um, you'll see they have all the figure drawings I did at Pratt Institute. And some of them are highly representational. But I choose to, I choose to, uh, to do things in a stylized way because I just have, for me it's more fun. If I wanted to take, if I wanted a picture of a person that really looks you know, lifelike, I'd take a photograph. And so that's, Matisse also said that. You know, if I wanted it to look like a real, a real person, I'd take a photograph. But I don't, I want it to look like my idea of this person. But I would say study. And there's a great organization called the SCBWI, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. I was just at the New England uh, conference um, a couple of weeks ago. And th that's a wonderful organization to join. You don't have to be a, a published author or, or artist to join it. And they have a good, a very good um, uh, New England um, division of that. Okay? Well, Tommy, thank you. Well, my pleasure, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.